I, I think it's important to note at the outset that this work was funded, as you mentioned, through the NSF uh, Research Experience for Undergraduates Program, um, Spatial Models and Electoral Districting uh, Site. And that was led by um, Jim Thatcher and Courtney Thatcher. And I've also been involved on the project. So I'll just address a couple of questions during the talk today. First, can multidimensional scaling be used with uh, travel time data to inform selection of better electoral districts? And this was the question we explored in our REU um, over the summer of 2019. And more generally, I'll discuss what the potential of MDS might be to make hidden narratives of relation apparent and accessible. So the topics that I'll cover today, what is MDS and why should we care as cartographers and perhaps more generally? Um, I'll discuss some traditional cartographic applications of MDS as well as the specific flavor of uh, cartographic applications that we have used. Um, we'll look at MDS for mapping non-Euclidean spaces with an emphasis on travel time surfaces. And finally, we'll look at applications of um, MDS for travel time surfaces to electoral districting and potentially a few other topics as well. What is MDS uh, for those unfamiliar with it? It is a form of nonlinear dimensionality reduction that uses pairwise distances that may be metric or non-metric um, among a set of objects. It then identifies a transformation to a lower dimensional space that best preserves those pairwise distances. Um, importantly, the number of dimensions that you are reducing to is up to you as the um, user of the MDS tool. A quick non-spatial example to provide some clarity on how MDS works, and I owe this to um, something posted to Grace Lowley's blog. The link is here on the slide. Uh, if we imagine we have 58 foods and we want to understand the similarities among these foods based on 10 different nutritional variables, we could consider those nutri nutritional variables to define a 10 dimensional space. If we normalize our measures of each of those, say protein, calories, et cetera, and then find um, distances uh, between all of the foods in a pairwise fashion, um, we can then apply multiple multi-dimensional scaling to reduce the dimensionality of that 10D data set down to um, say two dimensions and you might get a, a result uh, like we have visualized here uh, with emojis. And you can see it does, seems to do a reasonable job in grouping foods in a way that is intuitive, placing desserts together, um, greasy fast foods appear to have their own section a cluster within this two-dimensional space. So MDS has been applied in cartography in the past. Um, that's one reason why we should care about it. Um, I would say more generally that MDS has potential uh, for making visible uneven human spaces, uh, political, social, and more generally relational spaces. And I'll say more about that later as we get to the specific example of travel time and electoral districting. But first, I wanna say a little bit more of how it's been used in the past. Uh, it was a particularly popular technique among cognitive geographers in the early 80s um, in some of their mental mapping exercises. So what we see here, for example, is a mental map of Columbus, Ohio, based on an MDS of estimated distances between city landmarks. And several researchers in the early 80s employed MDS in the context of cognitive mapping. Um, other applications in cartography have included uh, user studies comparing map design elements. So there's been some recent work, for example, looking at um, different um, point symbols in the uh, cartographic context and um, similarities and differences among them. Um, and seeing what clusters emerge once you have uh, used MDS to reduce the dimensionality of these comparisons. 
Uh, but what we're particularly interested about in our REU um, is how MDS uh, might transform data that's already explicitly geographic. And so there are a couple ways of thinking about such transformations. Um, one is the reprojection of geographic data into um, non-geographic multi-attribute spaces. And this was an approach of you using MDS that was suggested, uh, for example, in an article by Scoop and Fabricant 2013. And they suggested it might be a good way of visualizing census data, not in the context of blocks and block groups laid out on a map, but instead in terms of um, looking at the uh, different um, census data attributes um, and um, comparing uh, um, block groups in that way and mapping them into a multi-attribute space. Uh, but what we are even more interested in is another, yet another application of MDS to geographic data. It's used for um, looking at non-Euclidean spaces, more specifically travel time mapping. And this as well has been um, a long time favorite among cartographers um, with work reaching back to um, at least the 1950s. And throughout the history of travel time mapping in GIS and, and cartography, you know, there's been an emphasis on uh, space as experienced through human travel and um, the ways in which this uh, makes apparent that space as lived by us is lumpy and uneven. And uh, the cartographic pro uh, products produced to show this um, wind up reshaping some familiar geometry um, in unfamiliar ways. And interest in this area has continued to the present day as I think in you know, Nick's uh, previous talk did a, a great job of illustrating. And uh, this more recent article, for example, by Bergman and O'Sullivan, 2018, demonstrates some of that continuing interest in mapping relational spaces um, in general and travel times in particular with an emphasis on increasingly on big data applications, things that weren't uh, necessarily uh, possible back in the 80s when we were looking at travel time. Um, so with that background in mind, a bit more of our specific um, application of MDS, we looked at um, travel time surfaces for Ohio. We used OpenStreetMap Router to calculate all points to all points travel times. Um, we uh, did these between um, approximately 9,000 Ohio block group centroids, resulting in um, a little bit over 81 million uh, travel time values. That's a lot. So we used MDS to reduce the dimensionality of this data set. A um, couple advantages of this approach, um, it allowed us to reproject the geographic data into a space defined by our travel time distances, which we felt was more relevant um, for a question like redistric redist redistricting. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, and this allowed us then to consider proximity and clustering um, in space in a way that aligns more closely with lived experience. Um, a couple of disadvantages of using MDS in this way, our implementation, implementation does assume travel time by car. Um, there's always some subjectivity introduced into the MDS um, in that you have to choose what um, dimension you want to reduce to. Um, also, if you wind up choosing a dimension reduction where you're, you're not going down to two or three dimensions, uh, visualization is challenging. Uh, to give you a sense of um, our results, uh, this is showing a dimension reduction down to two dimensions um, for ease of visualization. So we have our original shape with the centroids of the block groups. Um, after reducing that um, to two dimensions, we see significant compression in the east-west direction in particular. That's due to uh, the um, prevalence of more interstates and high-speed highways going running east-west as opposed to north-south in Ohio. Um, how could we use this then for redistricting? The goal was to minimize travel time within the district. 
Um, another way of saying that would be to maximize travel time compactness, compactness being one of the standards used for drawing quote unquote good electoral districts. And so there are 15 congressional districts in Ohio, US congressional districts. And our approach then was to take, we determined 11 dimensions would actually be best um, based on some um, uh, analyses we performed for MDS uh, on our router travel times. And so then we took that 11 dimensional uh, distance data set, used K-means clustering and with 15 clusters to match the 15 existing congressional districts. And this was our result and it looks great. You think we're done, right? Um, not so fast. We have to adjust the result to ensure contiguity. It looks like things are mostly contiguous on that past slide, but if you studied it closely, you'd note that there are a couple of block groups that don't quite connect to their assigned cluster. Um, that's due to us using travel time as our metric as opposed to um, uh, physical distances. Uh, so we had to adjust that. Also, you know, there's that issue of we should have equal number of people roughly in each uh, district so that one person, one vote roughly holds, that's probably important. So we had to shuffle um, our block groups to ensure roughly equal populations. And that winds up being non-trivial trivial as it happens. So our next steps include fixing the code for equalizing populations in congressional districts. Uh, we also want to include factors other than travel time in the creation of districts because um, the courts have determined that things other than compactness are important um, as you may be aware. So uh, we want to consider existing boundaries uh, of cities or school districts um, among other things and also demographics. All these things are important in establishing uh, what's known as communities of interest which is an important consideration in districting. Um, we also wanna look at other clustering methods beyond K-means, one of the points of uh, emphasis um, in the REU has been the application of uh, a technique called Mapper, for example. Um, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but perhaps look for more in this space um, in future NASIS uh, meetings. Uh, applications beyond redistricting. Um, you could easily use this kind of approach of using router uh, on uh, for travel times and then um, MDS for dimensionality reduction to consider other important issues such as drive time distances from the nearest USPS box. Um, a potentially very important consideration right now given uh, implications for accessibility uh, of voting. You know, this is assuming of course that your nearest USPS box is actually still there. That's all I'll say about that. Um, other urban planning applications that account for travel time, um, identifying uh, bus routes or zoning schools. And one final application that's closer to some of my other interests uh, in the area of risk perception and communication for natural hazards. I'd like to use this potentially to compare physical and social distances. So instead of using travel time distances, I'd be interested in perhaps looking at network distances from tweets about Western wildfires. Um, in um, Twitter space or other social media spaces. Um, and then comparing those distances with uh, distance in physical space. I think that could be quite informative. Um, so lots of different potential applications. I'd be interested in hearing more about how you think this technique might be applied. Um, and I think I'm about out of time. So I'll, I'll take any questions if there is time for those. And if not, I'll see you in the Slack. Good grief. That was that was fascinating, David. And conveniently, your esteemed colleague, Jim, was helpfully answering just every question that was lobbed up there and smacking it out of the park. So uh, he was handling all the questions in real time. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, David. Uh, that wraps up this session. Now, I got to tell you, I've never seen a NASIS session so aligned uh, for collaboration among the presenters. This was just insane. And there's just loads of really interesting ideas and comments coming out of the chat area in Slack. Um, this is a virtual conference, but it doesn't have to stay virtual. We chat here in Slack, but let's uh, network with each other um, outside of Slack when this is over um, and email each other. you got cool ideas, make it happen. Um, I'm so honored to be a part of this community and thank you very much for all of your work.
Enjoy the rest of the conference.